Hi, I'm Steve Thomas, this is Cacophony. Let's dive into some great music, but first, a warning. This episode's music contains intense drama and strong passions. The piano is such a recognisable form. The sound of it is so familiar to almost everyone, of course. But I'm also thinking about the shape and size, particularly of a grand piano. Big, sleek, shiny, black. I mean, piano black is even an official colour. RGB 32, 32, 32, by the way. Equal parts red, green and blue. The picture and sound of the modern piano is so firmly settled in our minds that it's hard to imagine that there was a time when they were new and with emerging technology developing fast, new improved models, and sometimes dead ends, would appear all the time. This sounds a bit more like having a mobile phone, right? There's no evidence that Ludwig van Beethoven, one of the most celebrated pianists around in his day, ever bought a piano. Instead, he relied on the dealers and makers to loan or gift him their latest models, and I guess they wanted to be associated with him. We're essentially talking celeb endorsements here. So the piano of Beethoven's time, the end of the 18th and start of the 19th centuries, was very different. Think of the fancy furniture from the era. Nice woods, inlay and veneer, tables with long slender legs, and you get the idea. In short, the piano was quite delicate, a piece of musical furniture that could adorn your room. but it did also have the ability to play loud and soft. That's what the name even means, forte piano, later piano forte. Loud, soft, soft, loud. And it was these new ways, developing over around a 100 years, in which one could vary the sounds and colours from the instrument, to vary volume, or the feeling of attack, or articulation of a note, or to sustain notes and keep them ringing after your fingers had left the keys and moved on that led composers to write ever more inventive music for the piano, to delight in its possibilities, and to be frustrated by its limitations. And no one explored more widely or deeply than Beethoven. We're going to listen to one of his most famous piano sonatas, works for solo piano, the Appassionata. Beethoven wrote 32 piano sonatas. The clip earlier, where I was trying to demonstrate nice, domesticated piano, was from his first. But even that early piece is inventive and sounds really like, well, Beethoven. Incidentally, one of the things that's remarkable about Fanny Mendelssohn's Easter Sonata, covered last time on Cacophony, is that she was brave enough to write one in the first place. In the years immediately after his death, the 32 sonatas of Beethoven had already developed an aura and many composers were either too worried about potential comparisons in which they'd be found wanting, or felt there was nothing more to be added to the genre, nothing left to say, and they found different ways to frame their pieces. So for a while, piano sonatas themselves were quite rare. By the time Beethoven wrote his 23rd sonata, given the highly appropriate name Appassionata by a publisher sometime later, he was a well-established master. He'd also had a big fight with one of his best friends, and he was in the early stages of going deaf. Clues, perhaps, to understanding music like this? We don't actually know what inspired Beethoven in 1803-4 to write this music. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Because we get the gist. If you've ever spent time with little people, especially little people having a momentary meltdown, you might be familiar with the concept of big feelings. And I'm not being reductive or patronising, I hope, when I say that this is a phrase I really associate with Beethoven. We get the gist loud and clear, because whatever it is that Beethoven's feeling... He finds a way of letting us know. He insists that we know. 
and 200 years on, his feelings can still seem bigger and more important than anyone else's. And it's hard for Beethoven to squeeze all his big ideas into the tiny, delicate, slender-legged frame of the piano that he has available. Beethoven wants more, which means, in this piece in particular, we're often on the edge of what the piano can do. His piano only has five octaves of notes available, as against seven plus on a modern grand piano, and Beethoven's constrained by this. He wants more, and we hear it because at the beginning he goes all the way down to the bottom note, F, and he keeps exploring the lower reaches of the instrument, occasionally going up to the very top and plunging straight back down again. No, this thing still doesn't go any lower. It's one of the most violent pieces he wrote for piano. Perhaps some of the violence in it is just frustration that the piano can't yet do all the things he wants. We're in a world of agitation, and it's a roller coaster of contrasts, extremes. Not only loud music, but at the end of the first movement, for the first time in his music, Beethoven asks for three P's of quiet. Pianissimo. Being quiet, or very quiet, is no longer quiet enough. The sonata has three separate movements, and in the middle, we get a gentle set of variations, musing on the simplest of themes. It's a world away from where we've been, but still closely musically connected. Beethoven runs this movement quite abruptly into the finale without a break. Perhaps he foresaw and wanted to guard against people or future radio stations extracting this lovely music and playing it as a standalone piece. Whatever. It didn't prevent a Spotify ad just crashing in on me and spoiling the mood. Which is funny, because that's exactly what Beethoven himself does. Just as you're expecting the slow movement to conclude in the way that we instinctively know that it must, he shocks us with a sudden dramatic flourish that wrenches us into the last movement, full of scurrying, almost running music, with an underlying tension that today, never before, but just now, suggests to me someone running in the encroaching darkness. Whether away from or towards, I don't know. Beethoven's pieces are usually intense journeys. Often he takes us ultimately to a place of triumph, finishing in a blaze of glory. Not this time. No glorious victory here. Blazing, yes, but perhaps more in defiance. To be honest, I find it quite hard to talk about Beethoven's music, which is a slight disadvantage for a podcast host. But it's not really a problem because Beethoven's emotional roller coaster does it all much more eloquently than anyone can with mere words. So let's get down to it and have a listen. Click on one of the links in the show notes to hear the whole of Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. And then when you're done, come and tell me what you think. What did you hear in this music? You can leave a comment at cacophonyonline.com or send us an easy voice message. Also in the show notes you'll find suggestions for other easy things you can do to help Cacophony. Perhaps the most important thing you can do at the moment is to share it. We're on the cusp of hitting the 20,000 downloads milestone, and I'd love to get there in the next month, but I need your help to do it. There must be someone you know who you think would really enjoy this music or the podcast. Who are they? Please share it with them and get them to listen. Come back for more next time, and thanks for listening.